All right. So I, I, some of the stuff I, as you know, usual, I cribbed from uh, previous uh, iterations and also some of the websites. Um, but I just, this is just um, a way for me to look at, uh, you know, some of the things I liked note wise. Um, all right. So I feel like actually this is weird because all three of us were in the Bayes rules books, weren't we? I mean, well, I mean, um, you know, eventually. So it's kind of like some of this stuff is is a refreshers for all of us, except for I guess G Gabby. Um, she so, she she was leading a Bayes rule book club, and then when she had to take that break when she moved. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I don't know if she went back to it or what. Yeah, I think they said they were going to restart that club. Um, yeah. Thing, but so um, the, the, the you know the the, the typical. Um, you know, sort of classical estimation and inference that we would do as, as non-Bayesians. Uh, we have a little different procedure here. So the first thing we do is we form a posterior distribution. Um, um, the, by the way, this is all just cribbed from the, the book itself. We typically summarize by a set of simulations. Well, we can get uh, simulation-based predictor, uh, predictions for um, unobserved or future accounts that um, comes that account for this. And then <clears throat> lastly, we can add the prior. So all of this is sort of meant to be like, <clears throat> excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Man. Um, all of this is just sort of meant to show that, you know, we're comparing, you know, this idea of a prior distribution with a posterior distribution, you know, um, to try to, to try and and using likelihood as a way to try to figure out like you know how can we balance these two sources of information um this this comes up a lot but I just kept coming back to this because it just it just sounds so ominous you know uh, I don't know if anyone else saw this but my, my favorite quote is the real advantage of summarizing in um summarizing inference by simulations that we can directly use these to propagate uncertainty <clears throat> I feel like our jobs are a lot more complicated or it sounds a lot more fancy and complicated when we Say our, our goal is to propagate uncertainty. I don't know if anyone else felt that way, but I do I do love propagating. As yeah, as I mean, I think this has been a theme in the book, right? The advantage of all these posterior samples is you can more easily, when I say more easily, I almost want to say more, um, wow, how can I say it? Less error prone. It seems like it's like you just you can do it in a straightforward way, which you know is not wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're just oh yeah, by the way, you're 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 being way too thoughtful. I'm just mostly saying I love saying <laughs> propagate a lot. So <laughs> oh, okay. That, that was mo mostly, but yeah, no, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, no, I just love I just love saying that we're we're propagating uncertainty, not that we're like gonna measure it or assess it or. You should put that on your door to your office and say, um, no, don't no. enter propagating yeah. uncertainty. <laughs> Prop propagating uncertainty. <laughs> So um, yeah, there's a bunch of. Um, by the way, I don't know if anyone else had this experience, but um, I don't know who else knows this. But there's like a really great tidy. Does anyone else have this? Um, I'm sure you guys do, right? This is sort of tidy verse versions of all of this. Oh, how to run the code? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I'll just just in case I'll drop it in the chat. Um, oh, wrong. Wrong thingy um yeah just in case maybe i'll put it yeah so <clears throat> all right anyway oh what, what am i doing here I'm, got too many dang windows open okay so uh, i'm going to talk about <clears throat> what the first sort of data set they talk about is this election forecasting data set which is available in that github repository that i just showed you amongst others and so we're here, we're scatter plotting, um, you know, sort of vote share by incumbents um, in the Y axis and economic growth in the X. And so um, we see a nice, you know, fairly, I mean, it's, it's pretty sparsely populated in terms of actual data points, but we see, you know, fairly clear, pretty clear evidence of a positive, um, a strong positive correlation. I don't know how strong it would be actually, because it's not that many data points. And, but yeah. So, um, sorry, I said someone knock at the door. Um, so anyway, that's sort of what we're doing with this um, this first set of of exercises. So we're just looking at, you know, can we predict the share of votes from this growth um, predictor? 
I, I didn't really do a lot of digging into what what this growth thing measures, but anyway. So uh, yeah, lots of stuff happens. I probably should have not uh, printed all that out. But um, hey, Ryan, there's a trick that's not published. Not oh yeah. You put refresh equals zero. It won't yeah. spit those out. Oh, right. and, and as, as an argument. In yeah. Standard. Okay. To, yeah. Nice. Well, anyway, actually, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. It looks kind of. It looks pretty badass that I have this. Right. It looks pretty legit. <laughs> If, if 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 you guys were new news, I would be all impressed with my chains here. But uh, whatever. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I probably would use that argument. Um, so yeah, so when, when we do this, we get um, you know intercepts, and um, also they talked about this idea of using medians, and then what's called the median absolute uh, deviation, which is something I actually do a, quite a bit, and like I do a lot of like calculating time spent on like a survey page and sometimes people will go like we'll open up a page on our we have like a multi-page survey and um they'll open up one page and they'll just sit on it for like 10 hours you know and so that's that's not helpful so what, what we do is we calculate these mad um scores for each page for each person and we get if they're of a certain size we we get rid of that particular thing because you know they can sort of rest in the middle of our surveys but we you know we, we still want to measure how long they spend so um yeah so anyway this is um yeah this was just another way of um sort of showing this um so yeah um yeah and then one of the things they they, they did mention even though this isn't officially a standard error this Sort of this mad SD, the scaled median absolute deviation from posterior simulations is <clears throat> what we're using as standard error here. So one of the things that um, the, I thought was a kind of a cool part of the chapter was this whole idea of looking at the three different types of you know predictions that you might want to make that have differing sort of levels of, of uncertainty or they deal with uncertainty to different degrees so uh the first one is our you know old friend the point prediction i mean i think even if you're not a fancy bayesian person or you know whatever you've probably done some version of this you know in in, in some regression model so all we're trying to do is say hey we got you know given some new value of x of our of our predictor which in this case was growth you know what would be the best um, point estimate for you know what would be expected is um you know a election percentage of the incumbents so the one thing that's problematic about this is is it ignores uncertainty so uh, we have i mean we certainly have a nice point estimate but we don't really know how strongly we should sort of believe in it or or not strongly we should you know believe in it um and then the next two, Ryan, I'm probably going to need your help to help make sure I get this right. But so the next one is we're, we're adding uncertainty. Um, but what we're doing is um, providing, you know, sort of a distribution of, of, of value. So that allows us to calculate that level of uncertainty um, in what, you know, what predicted, you know, Y values we would get given new values of X. And then the last one basically is uh, the same kind of process before, but what we're, we're doing now is we're actually also calculating the sort of um, standard error of the um, outcome or like, you know, the, 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 the residual between the predicted and the actual Y value. I believe that's the case. Is that right? Um, Ron, did you, am I, am I wrong about that? I, I don't know if you're wrong. I'm not clear. So, I mean, the way I would say it is that the linear predictor with uncertainty are including the uh, errors on the slope mm -hmm. and the, the intercept, right? So right. it represents a, some distribution of uncertainty um, for the point prediction in some sense, right? It's like, here's the point prediction, but it's actually, I don't know, it's, you know, yeah. there's some error in that because I didn't, I don't have all the data. I fit a model and it has some errors on the slopes and intercepts. Mm -hmm. The predictive distribution includes now also on top of that, the irre irreproducible error, or irreducible error, the, uh, you know, the, Sigma, the what do you call it, the residual error, as you called it, right? So that's, right, right, the res residual um, Y. I mean, that's if that's yeah. what you were saying, then yeah, I, agree. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I just want to make sure that 
it came out the right. You said it a little bit better than me. So anyway, you can use this predict function uh, where you know we we say we have a new data, which in this case is a single data point of growth equals two. So you know what would we expect for incumbent percentage given that, right? So we're using that model to predict this, and we get a um, predicted y value of fifty two point four percent, I guess. Um, yeah, and then I like this because they actually kind of, uh, this will kind of speak to what I was just doing. So we, we the next thing we use is posterior underscore Lynn predict. So this is, you know, we're trying to get to at some level of uncertainty. And the way we do that is now I'm only printing the first 20, but I believe this is like thousands of or hundreds of lines. And so we have by the differing values of, on each of these iterations, this is not the, as I said, this is not the total sample. Of iterations this is just a cool little cross section to show we can use you know sort of the variability in these um, values to kind of get get at you know what the um as, as ron pointed out to get getting at like sort of the um you know, the variance for things like um, the, um intercept and, and um, slope um one of the things that they they do they talk about is doing this stuff by quote unquote by hand as opposed to using, you know, these sort of fancy package things. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the thing that's sort of remarkable here is um, we, we simulated the intercept and the, and the slopes, and um, we are using, you know, just that, that new value as a way to, um, you know, to, to estimate this, um, Sorry, yeah, new was just the one value, right? So we're we're simulating it a bunch of of times as a way of, um, you know, looking at you know how uncertain we should be or how 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 serious we should take these particular results. And then the only difference here is okay, so yeah, this we use posterior underscore predict um, as opposed to lin uh, posterior underscore lin predict. So. Um, Sorry, scrolling, all, jumping all over this. And then, so the only difference here for the by the by hand thing is is this. Yeah, I think you skipped you skipped a, a piece. That, so this is now you're talking about the posterior prediction. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So this is the third part, right? So this is yeah. we're not just dealing with um, you know tr we're we're trying to get to that you know the the res the residual um, predicted y value, right? And so what's new here in terms of the, the this model is this piece here, right? For the error terms, right? So we're we didn't have that, yeah. before, right? And so we're modeling, cool. yeah, we're modeling. We're saying that we're saying this has a, a mean. We don't have any reason to make any kind of mean predictions, but the um, the sigma is what we got from simulations and you'll notice here i don't know i mean this is just me eyeballing stuff but you can see how much more varied varied these 20 are than say these i don't know maybe maybe i'm wrong i don't know it kind of feels like it maybe i'm so you certainly you added on this our norm thing so you made it bigger yeah. yeah so this is anyway this is what the instagram oh i didn't do it for the other one sorry so um and then also yeah they talked about you know you, in the in the book you can you know, use this stuff to um, predict, you know, um, uh, you know, percentage of votes and stuff like that. Okay, uh, so anyway, that was that. Um, yeah, so, oh, and then, yeah, this, the, the, he made up this whole thing about propagating uncertainty. And, you know, I was, as much as I loved it, I was kind of like, what does that actually mean exactly, propagating? You know, I mean, um, so yeah, so let us say in advance of the election, our best estimate of economic growth was two percent, but with some uncertainty that um, she'll express as um, as a normal distribution with a SD of 0.3. Um, so anyway, these are these are sort of like our. Um, this is um, we're, we're now we we now have sort of like you know priors right. So we're we're using this information. Um, as a way to, um, oh yeah, um, actually, oh yeah. So the, yeah, this was just a way to kind of show how you know if we were to incorporate in this case, right? So what we're incorporating is this x. This this um, this is the the new piece here of 
you know, having the sigma, we're not, we're, 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 we're using that as a way. So this is certainly going to, you know, it doesn't change a ton. So before, before I incorporated the, before I propagated the uncertainty, we had um, 52.4, uh, or excuse me, before I propagated the uncertainty, it was, um, good Lord, sorry. Um, well, it was 52.4, um, the standard error of four. Yes, and then, it, yeah, the standard error goes up just a, a smidge here once we, once we incorporate the um, this uh, the sigma, this this we're we're, we're pro propagating uncertainty as it were. So um, yeah, all right. Then the last thing I got wanted to get into was um, kind of to show this idea of what they're calling Bayesian information aggregation, which is really just, you know, from our old Bayes rules days, is just another way of saying, how do we sort of mix, the, you know, the priors with posterior stuff and how does that interact with likelihood and stuff, you know, all the stuff that we did before. So uh, following in line with the book, I'm calculating what the, um, the theta hat prior as well as the, um, excuse me, um, and then also the standard error. So, uh, and then this is the information we have about, you know, what the actual, you know, posterior data that we're going to be collecting, 400 people, 190 say they will vote for the Democratic candidate. Um, and so now what we're doing, we combine the prior and um, data estimates. So this is the priors, this is the data. Um, making the key assumption um, that the prior and data represent two different sources of information, which I think that's pretty easy to, to say, right? This is, you know, sort of past evidence, and this is actual people that we know to be most likely voting in this coming election, right? Um, yeah, and they also kind of just talk about this idea of, you know, what are the sources for of uncertainty for each of these two sources? Well, um, you know, the, the previous uh, forecast model that got us to this um, 52.4 and 4.1, that's certainly those, re those residuals are where we, you know, um, get that 4.1. Uh, and then the uncertainty just from sampling variability. Maybe we did a really terrible job of sampling 400 people. I mean, and so you're, whatever you get, you know, you're there's a, there's a lack of certainty perhaps because of the quality or the nature of the people that you that you um, surveyed. So anyway, they um, this is all code from the website where we're you know we're, we're we we have the, the 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 prior theta and standard error, but now um, we're we're calculating the data values for each of these and then using them both to combine to show that you know prior to our posterior calculation this was sort of the prior versus you know what the likelihood would would have told us but then we get um you know to this which you know kind of makes sense right that the posterior would be you know closer to the likelihood and not you know because they're obviously saying kind of different things is that fair to say um anything else i'm missing from this this part of the, the chapter it seemed to me like you know, this is sort of review for us, obviously, because we already did some version of this already. But um, yeah, any questions? We'll take that as um, as a uh, yes or as a no, and let's move forward. So um, no, that's good. good. Yeah. So review, you know, this, like you yeah, this is the part that probably I'm still like, you know, I probably did not learn this properly from Bayes and I need to get into this more, this idea of different types of priors and, you know, you can use different types of, you know, um, prior distributions as a way of kind of dealing with your assumptions. Um, I think the way that we've kind of dealt with it so far is just having really weak priors or not really, you know, I mean, for a lot of the examples that we're doing. But uh, anyway, yeah, this idea of, you know, using what are called flat or uniform um, prior distributions are non-informative. Um, yeah, and so is, you know, it's, 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 I don't know, I guess I couldn't really think of a good reason to do this other than, you know, you don't really know anything else. Uh, they talk about this idea of default prior distribution handling within, you know, the sort of the stand GLM kind of framework. Um, 
you know, is, is, you know, it's, you know, basically, I guess this is what, you know, Stan G11 is kind of doing um, as a kind of a, you know, default. Um, I wasn't really sure how to define like weekly informative family of prior distributions. I guess they're saying this isn't like fully Bayesian because we, we're, we're, we're actually using data to kind of to deal with this stuff, but, you know, a prior, uh, you know, a, tr a true prior would not have data inform this, but I, I, yeah, that was kind of interesting to me. Um, and then lastly, uh, the last thing that I, um, you know, wanted just to point out, I didn't get a chance to really like write it up or do this, but they, they have a nice example in the chapter about like, you know, how having an informative prior, which of course, well, by the way, one of the things that I, I, I kind of left unsaid was, you know, you can use your subject matter knowledge, which I have seen people do that as a way of sort of informing priors and making them more informative. Um, but yeah, so, so this idea of beauty and the sex ratio, which um, is like, you know, this idea of, I guess there's some evidence that um, attractive people are, are slightly more likely to um, have uh, girls as opposed to boys, which was sort of, sort of interesting. And so in um, basically what they, you know, making a long story short, this is, you know, without just using default priors, we see, you know, kind of this big mess, but when we actually have informative priors about something we know about these issues of gender and um, attractiveness, I guess. Um, so yeah, we can see there's, there's a lot, they're a lot more focused as sort of, um, you know, um, a group of, of model estimates. So that's, you know, and I, I thought this was like a nice sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, this display or, or, or kind of a demonstration of, of how having informative priors can make a difference. But uh, that's that's all I had uh, for this um, go around. Um, did um, I didn't get a chance? I, I, of course, I wanted to get into the exercises. I would be willing to if you if you want to spend some time. Next week, I, I could get into two or three of them. I just didn't have any, enough time this week to do. This was like, I had to reread this thing a couple of times. It was it was a, a challenging chapter. Any um, comments? Uh, I did look at a couple of the exercises myself. Um, I don't remember there being anything particularly awesome about them. <laughs> right. Uh, they're just kind of like reinforcing the chapter a little bit. Yeah. Number 10 was kind of interesting. Hey, hi, Gabby. Hi. Um, so I don't know. I'd rather, I think, I, I, it's up to you guys, but I'd rather just move on to the next chapter. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I, unless everybody else really wants to spend another week and go into a little more detail, I'm happy, I'm happy to. No, I mean, it's because I think a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing in coming weeks um, will be, um, you know, sort of dealt with. Um, I did you want to point out that, like you, I also find the concepts of the uh, different kinds of priors. I don't think I quite fully grokked that yet. I really need to take some time to look in the other. Well, I, guess I, I, I guess I assume that you did because you kept talking about flat priors and, you know. Oh, no, I understand a flat prior. I understand that, but like, what considered exactly is a weekly informative prior like what you know what you should do i know what the default priors do they're yeah. not really weekly informative like the book says they're they use the data itself to try to estimate yes. the scale and that's part of what weekly informative priors do from my understanding is they're really just intended to kind of set the scale to keep things it's almost like a regularization right it's just like make sure the priors yeah. don't go too far away to stabilize the fit right um Right. So, and you can also maybe put some, a little bit more information into it. I guess there's a lot of it's, you don't want to say it's subjective, but a lot of it does require some subject matter knowledge, right? It's like, oh, I know yeah. from past experience that this is kind of a reasonable range of these things. So I'll like take the signal be like twice into that, twice that or something, right? So yeah. like, make sure they're not really squeezing it too much, but I do want to make sure it doesn't go out to like a hundred times that or something, right? Which is completely, I know that's ridiculous. Yeah. I didn't really work on this project, but I, I, there was a, a unit I used to work at Cleveland Clinic in Neurology. There was like a, a Bayesian guy who like 
yeah they were, they were doing something with like i forget what but like yeah we got all these like neurologists to sit around and figure out like you know what is population level of this particular like symptom or something you know what i mean and so it was like yeah I, I I I kind of heard a little bit of that conversation, but yeah, that's kind of like the using. See, that's a good example. You might use a, 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 an informative prior, right? Because then you're talking about like base rate type things, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It actually, it was kind of funny because uh, you know we we study this thing called uh, episodic versus chronic migraines, and so like chronic, as you can imagine, is worse, and episodic only happens once in a while. And because it's Cleveland Clinic, it's the second you know you know highest ranked hospital system in the world. Like uh, at a population level, you'd only get to see like um, 3% of the population would have chronic migraines, right? But like 54% of our sample had chronic migraines. Why? Because everybody comes to like our cl clinic, you know? But yeah, so that was, um, I do remember that there was this whole discussion of trying to figure out like what was the best like estimate of like a population level, you know, um, rates or whatever. But anyway, uh, we still have some time. I uh, first of all, one thing I want to just address real quick is: uh, Does anybody want to jump in and do next week's? Otherwise, I will sign up now to do it. But I guess really it would be either Gabby or Alma, um, right? Yeah. And Gabby, how you doing? I haven't, I haven't heard from you yet today. <laughs> oh, um, what next week is? Next week is multiple variables and also uh, indicator variables, that kind of thing. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Um, I think you probably, uh, I think, didn't you do multiple linear predictors, um, like when we did Bayes rules? I feel like, or, I don't know, maybe it was the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, probably, you, probably just, you probably just dust off those notes. <laughs> okay, yeah. so I will do that one then. Yeah. But as you said, it I don't know. Even though there were examples in it, there was a lot of text. So I have to break it down yeah. with examples to, to see, okay, am I yeah. understanding it or just going through the book? Well, yeah. no, I, I agree. Believe me, I, I struggle with the same thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, especially when it gets dense like this. Yeah. I mean, here's another thing that we could do is like... Um, you know, I mean, if, assuming, you know, I mean, this is just a, I'm just spitballing here, but one thing we could do is instead of like doing like a presentation, which, you know, this is, I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. It's just my own personal bias, but uh, we could do like, we could just pick out like, you know, a handful of, um, of uh, items or exercises and just work on them after like, or maybe a brief or like summary of, of the key issues. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud, but. I think that's a great idea. I mean, that's yeah. not yeah. bad at all. There's it's just no like sometimes I... examples don't really make sense. Like the beauty and sex ratio, it makes sense, but really it doesn't make sense because it's not example you really do. <laughs> I don't know. The BB, I'm sorry, which one? The BB what? Oh, sorry? The, the beauty and sex ratio. Oh, example. yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. It, it's an example, but it's not an example you really do. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, you could do it. It's just you need a lot of um, you need a lot of uh, data to to really to um, which is probably not easy to get. Well, I mean, um, somebody did do it, right? And that's there was actual real paper. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Like, why did they do that? I don't know. Oh, I mean, there's all kinds of like stuff. Like, I mean, this this actually is one of the things that re observational research is all about. Is like kind of digging around and trying to find something you know that may not be, you know. Uh, you know, a parent, obviously you don't want to just do, you know, wacky things. You want to have you know, things that are de theoretically defensible, but yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think that the beauty sex ratio thing is theoretically defensible. Like oh, no, I mean, believe me, there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole <laughs> evolutionary psych, there's a whole evolutionary psychology and biology, like argument about you, you know, attractiveness and, and, um, there know. is okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I couldn't. No, but then the theory was that beautiful people give birth to girls. Like right. that connection, that doesn't. I don't know how that helps. Like, but I guess as you said, everybody has their cup of tea. 
Well, yeah, I mean, part of, part of it is, is uh, you're you're just um, tr- well. First of all, you're trying to like, you know, show can this this phenomena even be relied upon? You know what I mean? Um, like, so I think the first, yeah, just empirically, can you even show that there is an effect? You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it is. I I, I don't necessarily. Mm-hmm. I don't disagree with what you, your your sentiment. That's for sure. Totally. Anyway. So yeah, you, I, mean, I could I could spend like fifteen minutes going through like nine point one zero if you think it might be useful. Yeah. I didn't really prepare it to be presented, but I'm looking at it and it looks like it might be might be understandable. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah, Gabby had to go, but we oh, have yeah. like 30, 30 minutes. So. All right. Let me share my screen. We'll just try it. You guys don't like it just tell me <laughs> oh hey so you should be able to see my yeah art studio and i don't i don't have to oops sorry move this little black box out of the way here we go well man you uh, like you, you do all kinds of like the, the code i like how you code for the, the the you know to make the formula i, I always forget to do that it's pretty sweet uh, i'm just i'm trying to get better at the LaTeX, I don't know how to say it, LaTeX, LaTeX, I don't know what people say. I'm trying to I, think, I, I always thought it was, I thought it was LaTeX, but now I hear LaTeX. It's it's all a mess. Yeah. So I'm trying to get better at it, so I'm using it more and more. Sure. I keep finding spelling errors. Anyway, so that, this question was considered. But you know, like, original LaTeX people will say what you're doing is not LaTeX. It's just armored down. <laughs> oh. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Ron. Um, so this is a question about prior distributions, which we were just talking about, right? And the model is just a simple linear model, y equals ax plus b, and with the um, with some error, right? Normal error. And the predictors are uniformly sampled from minus one to one, right? And we're supposed to be taking independent priors on the coefficients um, that they give us. In fact, it tells us that the independent, the prior on A is a normal prior with mean zero and standard deviation one, which is the intercept, right? And for the mm-hmm. slope, he says, assume a normal prior with a mean zero and a standard deviation 0.2. So these are all things you can just put in, right? So first step is, I guess, simulate the model. Okay, yeah. So you stick the parameters in. We're supposed to do 100 points. That's what they said to do, right? So yeah. uh, intercept one, slope 0.1. <laughs> Sigma 0.5. And I set the C just because that way when I run it over and over again, I don't get different answers. <laughs> Except what I want to. And so I simulate the X's, create the fake Y's, and then I'm going to plot them, right? So that's my data. Now it looks pretty uh, noisy, right? So I think that was the mm-hmm. intent here. It's very noisy data at the very shallow. Positive. It's, it's, it's positive. That's a positive correlation, though. Yeah. So we do the stand GLM. So here's how you do stand GLM with um, verbose equals false. Yeah. Oh, refresh yeah. equals sorry zero. Sorry. Verbose equals false for the print because the print also fits out a lot of extra stuff, which you probably should look at. But I'm trying to. Yeah. You know. So uh, the data is my table that I made up there. The prior they said for the prior without anything after it is the prior for the slope or slopes. I guess we'll find out next week how you specify those because I kind of forgot already, but. For a single slope, you just you can just put a normal in there, right? So a point two is what they told me. Let's check and make sure it's really true. Yeah. And the intercept was prior was zero with a one for the uh, standard deviation. Refresh equals zero, so it'll depend on a bunch of noise. And I can even rerun this. I think I probably have to let me just let me just uh, make sure that the libraries are loaded. So if I do want to rerun something, I can. The only one I don't want to rerun it, I'll show you, you'll see in a minute where I ran into a problem. <laughs> hmm. All right, so boom, prints it out. There we go. So uh, let's think about this. So now this intercept is one. That sounds right. That's what mm-hmm. we put in. The slope is 0.19 plus or minus, well, 0.2 plus or minus 0.1. Uh, I thought By that way, was can, interesting. Can, can, can we refresh? I'm sorry. What, what is X and Y? Like, what, are they even anything real? Or nothing. Anything? They're nothing. Oh. They're just. Okay, okay. Okay, this is a okay, fake, model, fake linear model. Yeah, they don't mean nothing. Yeah. But the original slope that we put in was 0.1, which I think is interesting. And I'm not sure why, but I ran this thing. You know, if I run over and over again uh, with different data, I mean, it seems like the slope is always biased up. Hmm. <laughs> I think that's probably. I have no idea why. Actually, I can't understand why, because my the the prior should squeeze it towards zero, right? Right. 
and the data was generated with a slope of one, but it seems to almost always be a little bit positive. So that's a question I have, which I don't know the answer to. Because <laughs> it gets, because the prior was 0.1 and it's 0.191 is what you're yeah, saying. It's in the, I mean, it's within the, you know, one Sigma, yeah. but it seems to be almost always up. Maybe it's not always up. Maybe I just ran like 10 times or something. So I, I maybe just being yeah. not, talking about nonsense, but um, yeah, anyway. That's cool. Yeah. Um, oh, and then. Unless, yeah. Wait a minute. I wonder if something. Did I make a mistake? Uh, prior summary, is that what it's called? No. Oh. No, I did not make a mistake. I thought maybe I made a mistake and I got the location scale arguments backwards, but no, I didn't. Okay. Mm. There's this function called prior summary that'll tell you what the priors it put in there. So there you can, and I'll just, it's kind of a useful function to check, especially if you use the default priors. Like I didn't put in a prior for Sigma, right? That's cool. But there is a prior, here it is, right? It's exponential. Well, mm -hmm. with rate 1.7, it says I put in that, but that, I didn't put that in, that's just the default. But since I didn't specify one, it'll, it'll adjust it to, by the data scale. Hmm. Wow, what, what, and what, I, I didn't, I meant to do the one on the comparing to least squares, that, that what, what happened with that one? Okay, so yeah, so comparing it to the least squares, that's a good question because now the squeeze least squares is, should be the same thing as I put like flat priors in for the standard right. GLM. And yeah, and the slope gets biased up too for the for least squares. So I don't know. It seems weird. So it was 0. 0.191 and now we're 0. 0.19 something and now it's 0. 0.24. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's really high up. So the, the, that tells you something, right? That prior did help bring it down. You know, okay. well, not only that, but you know why it's 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 down from two point two four. We're propagating uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why. I, just love, I wonder. Just love saying that. I do wonder why that slope gets biased up. So no, one, is that something that's for your? I mean, it seems like this is a straightforward model. I don't. Maybe hmm. it's just. I don't know. Maybe I'm just got a weird seed or something. No, uh, I don't think that could. Oh, it's even. It's got to be even more than. Oh, it's yeah, it's higher. Point two, yeah. You can tell it by looking at it. Good guy for. Dude, I, well, I used to. I taught like research. <laughs> so one of the things that we would do is look at scatter plots and try to like estimate like you know. Um, wow! Look at that. Oh, I see. So it's just such a wide. No, okay. So now it's zero with that data set. So it's just a big wide uncertainty because of the large, gigantic. Uh, errors on the residuals that's causing that because look right. this time i got this time i got zero <laughs> okay wow now we compare that's... that to the least squares at least yeah. squares also get zero okay but my um zero is a little bit my actually mine was pulled yeah not really they, they basically consist with each other at that point the prior didn't have any effect the prior wouldn't have any effect because the prior is very wide around zero so wait a minute was it was was x was that the value for x before for least squares or is that wait a minute no because I reran everything with the new. Uh, oh, the new set seed. Okay. Yeah. So never mind. It's not the case that it's, it's biased. It just happened to be a bad luck draw, or not yeah. bad luck, but you know, it's with it. It's a big, big variation, right? Yeah. Variation is point one, right? So we shouldn't be too surprised. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. I was, I was seeing voodoo again. So the fits are pretty close, um, and you can come ignore my comment there. So now this part, what I did. Now the next part, the last part was okay. Repeat the simulations for different values of n. So n started out, we did this for 100, right? So uh -huh. it said, repeat the simulation for different values of n and graph the Bayesian estimates for a and b. And also, um, the um, and it says for part c, also graph the uh, least squares estimates, right? Mm. So well, actually, I didn't say graph, but I just did anyway. Uh, so this is this weird code right here, which I'm sure you'd probably find disgusting because it's got a for loop. That's always a bad no, <laughs> All right. <laughs> you say I just repeated all the code I did above, right? But I just made n an argument. So when I generate the data, there's n data points instead of a hundred. That's all I did differently. Mm. Um, the reason I bet, for there's the some, I bet there's some way to do this in Per that's like way more elegant, probably, right? But yeah, I would guarantee you. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I did was kind of weird is I wanted to return all four of these results, so I made I returned a list and then had to like mess around with it to put it back into a table properly. I think there's some better way to do this. I was actually gonna ask, let me go back to that in a minute. 
But first is for loop. What is this all about? You're probably wondering. Is that when you do it without the for loop, you just do like, you know, I just did for n equals, um, well, I just, I didn't have value with this, but um, where's the n's? Ah, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 60, look at these n's right here, right? Um, oh, so I see you, you did map DFR. Okay, yeah, nice. These last, these, um, these, um, what am I trying to say? These, these are, these are sample sizes. Yeah, so I do n samples. It's very, very noisy, right? And I really mm. want to see what the overall trend is. So I did an average. That's mm. what the n average is. So I did thirty times this thing for each one of these, and it takes a minute. <laughs> I'm not going to rerun it because it takes yeah. a long time to run. Yeah. But if you do that, um, and you can then plot, even then you can see it's still pretty noisy. I just I thought maybe I should do more. Um, wow. So the stand. Um... So wait a minute. So the, the value on the y-axis that what does that mean? That okay, means... so let me tell you because I didn't label these things properly. So the value is the slope. Oh, right? okay. Values is the default name of the column when you do a uh, pivot longer, right? So <laughs> yeah. So basically, like if you're doing stand, basically it's 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 suppressing or it's pushing the slopes towards zero, exactly. but they're more reliable than on on a, on a Case by case basis than the LMs. Right. Remind you, remind you that every one of these points is actually an average of 100 fits for that particular end. Right. So the, when you don't do the average, you get a whole, this, this plot is a lot more um, noisy. And so, so if you do more yeah, averages. Yeah. If you're doing stand, if you're, I mean, so basically, if you, if you find a nice slope doing the stand models, you really found something, most likely. Well, I guess the point I would take away from this is that you can see the effect of the prior, right? So for low number of n, when n was five, this point right here, the value I get is pretty small, right? Because it, the prior is going to inform the result of the slope quite a bit. Oh, right. Oh. But uh, but then, then we go high still, end. I would still you, say that's not a lot of difference from from you know from left to right for the blue or for the stands. I mean, that's still pretty. Well, I mean, I mean, that's well, you go from like point oh one to. Point one, that's a big change, right? It's factor of 10. Yeah. So in the, on the right hand side of 300 data points, you can see the stand and the LM results. Yeah. Are close. And that's because the prior no longer makes any difference anymore. This, right. We washed it out with, we washed it out with data. That's what I'm yeah. going to say. The conclusion of that is. Um, yeah. So the, the, this is the kind of the regularizing effect too of the prior, right? So for low numbers of N, I don't make a big strong statement about the slope because I know that I don't have much data. So it, it kind of automatically compensates almost for. Um, yeah, that's really cool, man. It's a regularization effect, right? Yeah. How dare I say with five data points that the, you know, <laughs> the slope is 0.3 or whatever that red dot, or whatever that's 10 data points, right? Whatever. Um, I don't have enough data to really support that, right? So that's, that's yeah, what I got. It's really cool how, like, you, you can see the influence of the data. Yeah. 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 For the same thing with the intercept, you don't see as strong an effect necessarily. Mm -hmm. And that's because the intercept prior was really wide. So I don't really get mm -hmm. much out of the intercept slot, but I did plot anyways. But dude, for someone who says this, he's not really an R user, you're doing all right, man. I think there is a probably better way to do this than map DFR. I don't know, but I mean, map DFR well, works. No, no, I, I just, I, I actually, <laughs> yeah, the only thing I would do differently is, you know, you probably could use some, some um, pipes to make like the GG plot function look a little bit like, I like to put like one thing on each line. Like, so for example, oh, after, this mess. Yeah. Yeah. So I, before, so right before select, I would push, I would, I would click on select right before and then I push enter and that, that's like a new line right there. Oh, that would yeah. make it clearer. Yeah. I see what you mean. Like, yeah like, yeah because i know compared to python like the spaces and like line yeah that's true it matters it doesn't matter in r except it's just a way of like reading. yeah in fact anyway. it might make sense to put i still don't there. use like the, the native pipe i'm still using the reader i gotta use that but yeah there you go looks pretty something like that maybe i don't know yeah yep um, anyway, that, that, i don't know if that helps anybody but that's that one the only other one I actually looked at for this is this exercise nine nine, which is all just kind of I just was playing around with this one a lot because it's kind of open ended. Um, 
He's just saying, okay, you got a regression prediction. You do a regression predicting a final exam score from a midterm exam score. I don't know if anyone else immediately think, wait a minute, wasn't this a trap? Did we <laughs> did we find out there's some regression to the bead issue with this? But anyway. yes. <laughs> well, yeah, no, conceptually, yeah. I mean, like that. by the way, regression to the mean is it's not the trap. It's just when you when you're when you when you have like a negative, you know, predictor or something like that, like yeah. you know. Like, when you, when you have some weird finding that you, you need to be able to say, well, it could be, just be, you know, rest for the mean. So I took a look at that one as well. Um, and so he says, okay, both exams were on a scale from one to a hundred and the typical score is ranged from 50 to hundred. So people generally do better than 50%. Like, so maybe the, the typical average is like 75 or something like that. And the correlation of the midterm and the final is somewhere in the range of 0.5 to 0.8. And then finally, the average score on the final exam might be up 20 points higher or lower, mm -hmm. right? So he wants us to take this like word problem and interpret it into some kind of reasonable, I would say, you know, priors for the slope and the intercept after centering, right? Um, so starting with the um, slope, right? Starting with the intercept, I guess what I said, I said, well, for the intercept, you know, I want it to be like from zero to a hundred. I don't want it to, to um, be outside of that range. So I decided I would use a beta distribution. I don't know if that would be like what you would use there, but I decided a beta distribution, you know, multiply by hundred, right? After the fact with a mean of like 75 and a standard deviation of about 0.4, that would cover the whole range pretty broadly, right? Uh, the range of 50 to hundred as your uh, possible results, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you guys? And yeah. so I just guessed like that. I know, you know, what the, um, that the mean of a beta is used alpha over alpha plus beta. And I don't, and I looked up because I don't memorize the formula for the variance and I just tried different values. So three and one, actually, I, that was my first guess and it turned out to work really well. <laughs> so I just, oh. Gonna, oh, actually, no, it's not a good guess. I actually was really wanting to go to Steve and Sandy point four. So I guess I just, anyway, I should have tried something else, but so let's fix that. Let's go bigger. So how do we go bigger? Just go bigger here. So alpha is four. Let's try that. <laughs> nope, not enough. How about five? Okay. Wait, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? I'm going the wrong way. Oh. Wait a minute. So, I'll, so just to make, make sure I'm clear. So wait, so you're, so you're saying that the intercept is three, right? Yeah, I'm saying the intercept should have like an average of 0.75, but I want it to be wide, about 0.4 standard deviation, right? As wide as I can get it anyway. Oh, I see. I guess I can't get it to be 0.4 because we're limited because it's a beta distribution. Yeah. We can actually plot these things, but. I don't know. I was just kind of guessing around here. I don't have any, I'm, this seemed like maybe not a bad idea, but. No, this is, this is really cool, man. I, I, I wish I had take, I, I spent a lot of time. You got it really high, then it goes. Yeah, so increasing alpha decreases the, uh, the deviation. Cause you have basically have more data. Like there you go, there's right. a very high alpha. Yeah, that's right. And like they even say that as much as like, you know, as the sample oh, goes to infinity, you know, the there the error goes to nothing. Yeah, so there's a very sharply defined, right? Very sharply defined, but I know that I that the exam scores can be between fifty and hundred, right? So I want to make that much broader. So I'll just stick to my original guess of three and even though sand division doesn't get I mean, I could make it even smaller. I make it like one. Man, uh, you, you're motivating me now. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to do a couple of these exercises. Okay, one's for one. chapter ten, I mean. Yeah. I really so like doing, the top doing next though, week? Alf, uh, Alma is right. Oh, Alma is okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm doing chapter 10, okay. and mm -hmm. I would love your help with the exercises because I am sure I will stop. Yeah, no, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get into a couple of them since I'm not you know, preparing any 
any like you know pre presentation I'll, I'll try to get into that yeah there might be something wrong with my math in here but anyway i chose this alpha three uh beta one for my prior for that that was my logic on that so this the next part um i'm not completely confident in that choice but i think it's probably reasonable hmm. uh, another uh for the slope i chose uh well, we know the correlation. So there's a formula for the slope from the correlation, right? So the, if the correlation mm -hmm. coefficient is rho, then the slope is rho times the sigma y over sigma x, right? That's yep. the standard formula. So mm -hmm. since we know a range for rho from point, well, first of all, we don't have any reason for sigma y and sigma x to be different. So I'm just gonna ignore, ignore that fraction, right? They're probably on the same order of magnitude, at least. Uh, the standard deviation on the exam versus the two exams, I don't see why those should be different. Uh, I don't even expect there to be difference what I said. That's fine way I said. So I just said, well, that means the slope itself should range you from 0.5 to 0.8. So I just use, I would just use a Gaussian, God, I can't spell, can I? Uh, centered at the halfway point between like 0.65 or the sigma about 0.5, which is you know about two and a half times the, the difference there. That was my that's what I would call weekly and forward and prior on the on the slope. To help regularize it, but not constrain it too much, I don't think. It could be just 0.6 plus minus 0.5, right? The point, the 0.05 doesn't matter, but does that make does that make sense to you? Is how, is that, what do you guys think about that? These are not the correct answers. These are my answers. Just be clear on that. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that gives a big, broad range of reasonable values. That, you know. Yeah. Maybe you make it bigger just so you, it's possible that you know. Oh, with that kind of correlation, I don't think we expect them to do worse, right? Yeah. That's the prior, so that's what prior we have. One of the things I think that I've read in other books is they often recommend doing, and maybe this is something we'll get into in like a later chapter on um, after the fit, or whatever it's called, where is that? Oh, that's like the chapter after this, right? Chapter 11. Yeah. Maybe he'll talk a little bit about like looking at the prior, to, you know, how much your prior matters and like trying different priors to make sure that they're not affecting your results in too strong or a way that you can't support right yeah i have read that in other books where they, it's very important to look at the uh what the impact of your prior was oh yeah i know like I, like i was saying the, the 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 expert one where they did this informative prior thing that i watched i mean i think yeah they were writing down all the the, the notes and you know yeah you really have to have an argument for why it should be this versus that for sure i think from what little i know oh chapter 11 you it's all about like validation cross validation on that boy i didn't realize it's like that's going to go like cool but not about priors <laughs> oh, right. before before and after comes in like a lot later chapter 16. Hmm. maybe that comes in i don't know anyway I read in other places that it's important to uh, evaluate the effect of your price. So if I were to use this, do this model, and actually have data, which we don't have, um, I would try with this prior, but I'd also try like a flatter prior or a wider thing and see that what the impact was and make sure that it's supportable, right? But right. if it has some small impact, I'll say, okay, that seems reasonable. It had a huge impact. I better go back and think again about, am I, am I that confident about this prior? Should I make it less informative? That kind of thing. Yeah. I have seen papers where people actually present results with multiple priors, kind of like passing it on to the reader. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh well, yeah, no, but that's actually I would say that's good. I mean, that's 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 just like what you would do as a frequentist, where you would you know present multiple types of models. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, those are the two that I looked at that I you know was yeah. interested in anyway. Well, cool. Let me get back uh, out of screen share mode. Yeah. And thank you, Amma, for um, yeah. volunteering to take on chapter um, 10. And I guess I'll sign up now for chapter 11 since I, I, it looks interesting to me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I have my cat is meowing off in the distance. Oh, no. It means it's time for, for food. So yeah. I will um, I will see you guys uh, next uh, next week. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so take much. Take care.